Hola Saldeón, gusto hoy a Tangiatori. Buenas tardes y bienvenidos. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 2016 finale of the European Dialogues, defining the European narrative through creativity. The Globernance Institute for Democratic Governance, the San Telmo Museum, the European Capital of Culture, San Sebastian 2016, and Caja Laboral, Laboral Cucha have the privilege of hosting you all tonight, and as well as those watching us through streaming, to whom we invite you to participate throughout the evening uh, by sending us your comments and questions via Twitter at our account at EU Dialogues. We would like to give a special welcome to our guests of honor this evening, Richard DeMarco, Rose Fenton, Jens Nyman Christensen, and our moderator, Shabi Paya, as well as to Giles Sutherland of The Times, who will be writing a reflection on this evening's event for the EU Dialogues blog. Also joining us with his artistic talents, we have Pernan Gogni, who will be drawing throughout the event to conceptualize the spoken words into visual form. These illustrations, as long, uh, along with the videos, uh, photos, podcasts, and the blog, will be made available freely on the project website, www.europeandialogues.eu. And alas, the moment has arrived. It's been a work of love for the last few years, involving many people uh, with whom are here tonight. So I'd like to personally thank everyone for making this possible. Um, and, and thus we are here at the end of 2016, a year already notorious for the refugee crisis, the record levels of migrant, de migrant deaths in the Mediterranean Sea, record temperatures of global warming, the rise of nationalism and populism across EU member states, and the Brexit referendum, an event which one of our speakers earlier this year called a catastrophe. Plainly put, this year was no shining moment for the European Union. But we are not here tonight to lament, nor are we here tonight to complain and to point fingers. We can do better than that. We must do better than that. We have a choice. We can forge our collective future, feeding a culture of fear, division, and exclusion, the very sentiments which ravaged the European continent for centuries of ceaseless wars, or we have the choice, I would argue even the responsibility, to promote a culture of inclusion, dialogue, debate, and information exchange. This project, our work, is evidence of the latter choice. It has been my honor and my privilege to bring life and to direct the European Dialogues. In the course of three years, I've learned a tremendous amount from the more than 60 speakers from 18 countries representing diverse disciplines and expertises. We began in 2014 in anticipation of the European parliamentary elections by asking the existential questions, what is the European Union and where are we going? The sentiment at the time from the people in this city and across Europe was one of apathy, a lack of understanding of the functioning of the EU, and a sense of distance from policymaking in Brussels. So we went to work and organized 25 public debates concerning the European reality. Over the last two years, we focused on identifying the challenges and the opportunities for European integration, covering a range of issues, the Greek sovereign debt crisis, environmental security, free trade, human rights, migration, gender parity, government surveillance and privacy, our neighbors and allies to the West and to the East. The challenges facing Europe are many, but so are the ideas. If I can pass along any, men any message to you tonight from, the wor from years of work in this area, it is this. There is a wealth of untapped and underutilized human capital and potential. We must begin to listen to one another. It is essential to create public spaces for information exchange. This is the very pillar of a healthy and democratic society. We are different, but this also means that we each have something of distinct value to add. The challenge before us is to connect. So tonight, let's do that. Let's connect. Let's think creatively and begin the new year with a greater sense of purpose and conviction. And 
for that challenge, we have with us tonight Xavi Payan, who will be moderating, who is the Director of Cultural Programming for the European Cultural Capital San Sebastian 2016. Thank you, and enjoy the dialogue. Okay, let's start and thank you very much, Katerina Arrachaldeon. Good evening to everybody. I must admit, first of all, that uh, when people ask me about all the challenges that are supposed to be connected to the direction of a program of a European Capital of Culture, I say that it's true. There are many, many challenges and many hard works, but there are also wonderful pleasures. And believe me, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here sitting next to you, to these three experts, three wonderful voices that will help us today to talk about the new narrative for Europe from the perspective of creativity, arts and culture. I think that, and, and for that, you know that I will be moderating, but at the same time, I would like to, to give some background or some general context since I've been uh, guiding the program for the last, not the whole year, but the last three years. And um, I would like to at least remember how important are European capitals of culture in the construction of a European identity or a new narrative for Europe. As, uh, to start from that point, I would like to talk about an actress, about an artist, Melina Mercury. By now we already know who she was, but she was particularly important for European capitals of culture because it was in 1985 that she, as a minister for culture in Greece, decided to propose uh, that something was necessary, a project was extremely necessary to start boosting and promoting culture, European culture, a culture connected to European identity based on diversity and its richness ma mainly. For that, she uh, proposed a whole resolution that was accepted, and I would like just to read very briefly the main obje objective that she declared for the European Capitals of Culture. She said that the main um, aim is, or was to highlight the richness and diversity of European cultures and the futures they share, as well as to promote greater mutual acquaintance between European citizens. Then it was very, very extensively developed, and there are other re resolutions covering with the topic. But in 1985, Melina Mercury had already in mind the issue that we would like to discuss this evening here. Europe is based on different agreements. It's a union. And for that, I will remember, for instance, the Sustainable Development Goals established for 2030. Uh, they say there are three main pillars, I could say, that, are, that, that they are based. It's not me who could say that, but it's clearly referred since this sustainability is based in social sustainability, environmental sustainability and economical sustainability. And many, many people from the cultural sector and the cultural background claim for a fourth pillar that should be the cultural dimension. And culture is extremely important in that sense, since if culture is not considered as a fourth pillar for that development, we may be forced to understand culture only from its economical or social perspective and it's not fitting the full or the, the, all the uh, extensive meaning that culture and arts can have in, in this case. For that, since uh, 1985 and the last 31 years, 52 cities have tried to make wonderful contributions to the European identity, to express from Amsterdam, from Paris, from Turku, from Kosice, from Marseille, what can be European identity and what are the main contributions and the views or perspectives of these cities to that level. I remember that Melina Mercury specified when she was asked why cities, that she said states have represent, uh, are represented in Europe, regions are also represented, but cities are the perfect nexus between individuals and all these bigger institutions. So that's the perfect melting pot, the perfect lab or laboratory to experiment and try to have these good experiences 
to construct and build all together this European identity. As such, during this whole year, we have been working in culture for coexistence, in culture to live together, and as such, we want to remember, and I think that this monthly meeting that we have in European Dialogues is the best place to remember that we are Europeans and that we want to be Europeans. And for that, Europe needs to be wide and fitting for all of us. And the narrative of this new Europe, or new narrative for Europe, needs to be encouraging and inspiring for all of us. So then, uh, this evening, we will have uh, the possibility to talk about that. And I would like to just, before I start introducing the three speakers, uh, just remember how they will cover with different views of this new narrative from creativity or through creativity. First of all, and an absolute honor to be sitting next to Richard De Marco. Uh, he, he wants to be presented, I could say, as an artist and promoter of the visual and performing arts. I'm sure that the biography could be much longer. I'm tempted to say his age, but I won't do it. You may believe that he's older than me, but you will see that he's really younger. His spirit is all the time, since I've been talking to him, recalls and says that he's younger than me, that's for sure. He has been one of Scotland's most influential advocates for contemporary art through his work at the Richard de Marco Gallery and the de Marco European Art Foundation, as well as his professorship at Kingston University in London. His contributions to contemporary art internationally have been recognized on numerous occasions, receiving the Polish Gold Order of Merit, the Cavalier de la Repubblica d'Italia, the Chevalier des Arts and Lettres de France, and the Order of the British Empire as you see, a very extensive list of medals. Since the early 90s, 1990s, Richard de Marco's activity has been through the, the Marco European Art Foundation. Richard de Marco so far is well known because he has attended every Edinburgh festival. He has attended or been extensively involved with the Edinburgh Festival and Festival Fringe, the largest arts festival in the world since its inception. So, as you know, the dynamic for this evening will be, I will invite uh, Mr. DeMarco, and the floor will be totally yours, in this case, Richard, if I can call you directly, Richard. Yes, please. Okay, and so you will have 10 to 15 minutes to talk about the topic, about this new narrative through creativity for Europe, and then we will move into the next speakers. So, the floor is yours, please. Thank you. I stand here uh, absolutely frustrated at the idea that I should be speaking to you all in this amazing space. We are all part of something beyond words. As far as I'm concerned, in this setting, I'm dealing with the experience of grand opera in the Italian fashion. And I'm going to say that it's impossible for me to explain what the impact of 70 Edinburgh festivals has been upon my life. Can you imagine 70 times the experience of your festival? Edinburgh has been blessed and given an extraordinary challenge because every year it has the responsibility of bringing the world's greatest artists to explain the reality of our human lives in terms of all the arts. It's impossible for me to give you an idea of this. 
I've disregarded the idea of showing you images, but I'm very grateful for this extraordinary artist who is turning what I'm saying into a kind of visual language. And I congratulate the organizers for adding a dimension that I've never known in relation to conferences or symposia. I have taken the trouble to write down a statement about what I thought I would speak about, but having experienced the reality of uh, this city and this region, I must tell you that I'm completely overwhelmed and delighted with the reality that is, as far as the world is concerned, San Sebastian. But I'm very conscious of the fact that the culture that this great city represents is an unknown factor when you consider what is the European cultural heritage. How can that be? And what can be done to make sure that when we talk about Europe and consider its future, we include the Basque dimension? I was privileged to present the first and only manifestation of Basque culture two years ago at the Edinburgh Festival. And it struck me how sad it was that I was dealing with that problem. Why? Only one. When all the aspects of European culture had been given their proper place. And I realized there's a, a challenge facing me. And without doubt, I'll need your help. And there's no doubt these drawings are doing something which I never expected. And I'm so grateful to know that they are happening. But one thing I think I must do is explain how frustrated I am. Because I have to tell you as much as I possibly can tonight about the impact of culture upon the city in which I was born. I must tell you right now, by the way, the name my, on my birth certificate is Ricardo de Marco. And that means I'm a failed example of a Scotsman. I'm not exactly the personification of a Scottish way of life. From my very birth, I have known that I am essentially European. So I speak to you not as someone possessed of a British passport, but someone possessed of European nationality benefiting from the extraordinary evidence I have that there is no doubt that European culture and its heritage is the driving force of what we call, what we cherish as civilization. Think of it, the combination of the Christo-Judaic dynamic and the Greco-Romano dynamic, the combination has given us a history going back thousands of years. 
I'm so pleased to be here knowing full well that I'm not very far from Paleolithic drawings in caves made not yesterday, but 14,000 years ago. I'm amazed that I'm in that part of Europe where somehow or another the coastline directs me northwards and westwards to the Americas, to Newfoundland, to where the whalers and the fishermen would go. This is one of the great cities because of its very physical position as a port. I have to learn a great deal more about what it means to be a Basque. I must excuse myself for my ignorance, but I assure you from now on, I have a self-imposed task, which is to give to the Edinburgh Festival next year that extra and all-important dimension, which is to do with the Basque culture of Europe. Next year is a very important festival in Edinburgh because it will be an occasion in which we will be celebrating the 70th anniversary of this miraculous event. It should never have happened, but it did in 1947 at a time when Europe was in a state of despair, where hope had vanished for most human beings. And when, for example, this dear and wonderful country of Spain was suffering under a fascist dictatorship. Of course, so too was Portugal. And I'm thinking, perhaps the most significant events in the history of modern times have taken place since the year 1947, when Europe was trying to recover from being one of the worst examples or maybe the best examples of a battleground. Earlier today, I was reminded that, of course, the British have left their mark on Europe in the great war cemeteries that you'll find in Belgium, where thousands, tens of thousands of, of British human beings are remembered only by their names because they can't find their bodies. Now, you have to do something to make sure that Europe will never again be a battleground. It's ridiculous that it ever happened, not once, but twice in the 20th century. Maybe I shouldn't mention the word Brexit. It's an ugly word. And I thought that my main problem in my life would be, for example, the Iron Curtain, which separated most of the beloved countries that I adore in Europe from those that were apparently living the life of a democracy. But of course, it's difficult to believe now that 120 million 
Europeans were in prison for 50 years. And that happened as a consequence of the Second World War. I'm so amazed that we've survived. I think it is something we have to rejoice in and celebrate. And everything to do with Simon Veil, the great saint, sainted figure who helped create the concept of the European Union, that we can make sure that she is part of the 70th anniversary celebrations of the Edinburgh Festival. Because she comes from that part of Europe, which is very important to me, and I'm wearing a tie which indicates I'm an honorary citizen of one of its cities, Wuj. But she managed to survive along with her father from the agony of losing her family at Auschwitz. Now it's impossible to explain that this great continent which has it inspired every other continent, including the, the Chinese continent or the African continent or the new worlds of Australia, North America, South America, that this great continent has had to endure a pain which was unbearable, but now we have the evidence that something has happened for us to have hope. And only now, as I look at this, do I see that I'm among friends and collaborators, because I think this is the most perfect expression of the spirit of the European capital of culture. I'm so pleased the concept was really from the mind of a great poet, a great actress, a great artist, Melina Mercuri, because she personified the spirit of one of the great countries of Europe which cannot be defined by the Euro. Without Greek culture, we don't have Europe. And I'm thankful to this Greek soul who has fallen in love with this city for setting up this program. And I'm grateful to everyone here who has believed that this was at the very heart of the fabric of your program, these monthly get-togethers. I'm so pleased I've reached the age I have because I think my life would have been incomplete without the experience of being here with you tonight, this night. My job now is to let everybody know that I have good news to tell, that the future of the Edinburgh Festival, the world's greatest, biggest, most successful festival, is totally dependent on the culture of the Basque people. And I ask you all, to help me make it happen. Maybe the Edinburgh Festival, in its 70th anniversary year, should take place in San Sebastian. Now there's a question for you to think about in your dreams and in your conversations with your loved ones. I'm sorry I can't see you clearly, but I hope we'll have the chance to speak and 
I will have the chance to, to listen to your idea of what this city as the European capital of culture has meant for each and every one of you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Richard. Don't, don't panic, they are already there. I know that they will ask some questions. Just remember that you have the possibility to ask questions by using Twitter and the, the account of EU Dialogues. And otherwise, we will be happy to then, once the uh, um, presentations are finished, we will open the debate and the dialogue. So thank you very much, as I said, Richard. Now is the turn for Rose Fenton. Rose, in this case, is going to be if I can somehow organize the different views, but I mean, if you don't agree with that, I will be happy to discuss afterwards. We were listening to an artist. Now we now we move a little bit more to a producer. Let's, <laughs> let's change the view a little bit in that case. But Rose Fenton is much more than just that. It's an international producer and arts advisor. She co-founded the London International Festival of Theatre in 1980 and was its director for 25 years. From 2011 to 2016, just right now, she was the director of the Free Word, an international center for literature, literacy, and free expression. From 1998 to 2006, Rose was vice president and then president of Theorem, a European producing network of theaters and festivals from and across Europe. She's a board member of Aerowaves and the European House for Culture, an ambassador for the new narrative for Europe initiative. So she's then the right person to talk about and be here. Rose is co-author The Turning Word, Stories from the London International Festival of Theatre. She holds an honorary doctorate from the Montfort University and an honorary fellowship from Dartington College of Arts. And in 2005, she was awarded an OBE, an Order of the British Empire, for services to drama. So once again, the floor is yours, and thank you very much for being here this evening. Thank you. very much and, and it's just wonderful to be here. Can you hear me? Maybe I'll put the mic. Is that better? Fantastic. Now I'm absolutely delighted to be here and even more so having spent the day for the first time. I can't believe it's my first time here. Walking through the streets, walking up the mount, feeling really open to the world. I feel this is a city that is open to the world, bringing sea and land together and culture at the heart of it. And I was really delighted when Katerina sent me an email and explained that the idea of this evening is to end what has been, and I quote her, on all counts a demoralizing year for international politics on an optimistic note, dash, yes, we can, exclamation mark. <laughs> OK, that, quite hard, but actually, hold on, there is a real need to face this reality, to reflect above all and begin to see a way forward, share our thoughts and experiences, and look at how culture, creativity and stories can find a way forward in these post-truth dark times. And as somebody said was I, when I was in Berlin the other day at a Soul for Europe conference on the 9th of November when the world was waking up in shock at the Trump victory, someone said, hold on, better to light a candle than curse the darkness. So let's light some candles, not just one, but several. Um, and of course, I do speak from a country in which 48% of the population is still in profound shock. We woke up on June the 23rd and we felt something fundamental had been taken away from us. And young people, our young people marched on parliament shouting, you have stolen our futures. And of course the vote to leave has complex reasons and they have been rehearsed many times and have many echoes in continental Europe and, and the USA. And Katerina, you mentioned them at the beginning, a divided nation, revenge on political elites, 
fear of immigration, um, economic austerity, crisis of neoliberalism. But what is absolutely fundament fundamental from the UK perspective is that the UK never, ever bought in to the European Union idea as a peace project, bringing cultures and nations together. They always, they, you see I'm talking about they rather than we because I do distance myself, I'm a European, but, but, but the British saw it as an economic project. And why is that? Perhaps it's because we, unlike the continent of Europe, hadn't been subject to centuries of war, of conflict on our land. We hadn't been invaded since 1066. And perhaps also we clung on to this idea of our place in the world of empire. Very sad, tragic. Um, and yet the irony is that our language, more than any other European language, is made up of French, of Danish, of German. It is an amalgamation of all the European languages. So we are, in our expression, profoundly European. And of course, the consequence of the referendum, rise in hate speech and crime, open racism, further divided country, people fearful, a little Englander mentality, arrogant and insular, rises up once again. So the role of culture, of internationalism, in defeating this is more vital than ever. And it's something that I fought for all my life. Um, as, as you said, back in 1980, I set up the London International Festival, Festival of Theatre, inspired actually by Ricky's, Richard's work up in Edinburgh of this internationalism and opening up of new ideas, opening a window on the world. And I just left university with a friend and we wrote an essay. We explained why this was essential, an international theatre festival sharing ideas across the world. One of the reasons was that it was going to stop the Third World War. <laughs> we were naive, passionate. Um, but to come back to where we are today, because I think we are in at times of great danger and culture has a, a huge role to play, there is a telling story that I read. There was a conversation a journalist had with a retired trade unionist and Labour voter from a deprived northeastern part of, of, of Britain, Sunderland. He had voted to leave Europe. And when confronted with the fact that the Brexit campaign was based on lies, he was asked whether he felt betrayed. No, he said, we never believed a word anyway. Not a decent politician amongst them. And then he was asked, do you think that things will get better? No, he said, probably not. But at least they'll have to start listening now. And I think that listening, I think he said something very important. Listening is key. How do we listen better to understand what is happening right now? Not just with the group of people that we all know, that echo chamber, but how do we listen in a more wide, broader way? And I think this is something that the arts, creativity, and artists can engage with. Or perhaps we could be a bit provocative and say, you know, is the cultural community out of touch? Have they been serving an educated urban elite tied up with their own sense of, of, of their own importance? They're, or perhaps even been betrayed by the event culture, spectacle and entertainment as opposed to the kind of deeper engagement with art, asking the fundamental questions. You know, and in the UK, 98% of the cultural community voted to remain. And now they've started mobilizing, holding meetings, saying, what can we do? Um, and I'd just like to mention a, a situation in London where I think there is some hope within the cultural community. 2016 has been a terrible year. But one thing to celebrate is the election of Sadiq Khan as mayor of London, the first Muslim mayor of a major city in Europe. Sadiq, following Brexit, immediately put a plan into action. London is open, he said. 
London is a city for all Londoners. He wanted to show the world that London remains international and full of creativity and possibility, as well as reassuring the more than one million foreign nationals who live in London that they will always be welcome and that any form of discrimination would not be tolerated. He declared, London's culture is the thread that joins us all together and creates a city we can be proud of. He sees culture and creativity as the city's DNA at the center of his administration, alongside housing, the environment, and security. But Sadiq Khan is also asking some hard questions. He says, what do we mean by culture? Are we working with out outdated, elitist notions? How do we define it? He also said, haven't we been promoting London too much as a tourist destination and not for Londoners? Have we been pushing culture as commodity, not enlightenment? And he also said, he remarked, for all London's amazing cultural assets, why is it that only one third of Londoners feel they can make the most of the culture on their doorsteps or indeed are part of the creative life of the city? So Sadiq Khan has come up with an idea. It's called the London Borough of Culture and it's based on the European city of culture. And he sees this as playing a major role in the city's cultural landscape. Each year, he wants to focus attention on a part of London, a, a borough of London, and really create local celebrations of the cultures of people who live there. And I think the point I'm making is if we are to design the EU narrative through creativity, which is the title of this evening, we need to be mindful as to whose creativity we engage with. There are so many excluded voices. Whose imagination do we engage with? Whose voices are given a space to be heard? Who is part of the conversation? Who do we listen to? And this is something that we were, I was very aware of when I was director of the Free Word Center, an international center for literature, literacy, and free expression whose mission was to explore and celebrate the power of words to change lives. In our work at Free Word, we recognize the vital role of literature. I'd worked in theater before, but, but also across many art forms, but literature, storytelling, in helping us to make sense of the world, in giving a platform to often unheard voices, shining a light on untold stories, and vitally at a time of division and prejudice, fostering empathy, empathy which we seem to have lost so much this last year, and driving change. And there was a report came out last year, or beginning of this year, about called Writing the Future, and it was about the publishing industry in Britain. And they said, look, it's the same old people, it's the old monoculture prevailing. And unless we have an innate understanding of the diverse communities, ideas, and stories that make up this small island, Britain risks being a 20th century throwback, out of touch with the 21st world. Huge opportunities are lost. And translation was also an important part of our program, opening up literature to other, of the literature of other cultures to the British public. In Britain, only 4% of the books published are in translation, compared to, say, I'm sure in, in Spain, it's probably 50, 60%. We are always dominated by this Anglo-Saxon arrogant mentality. So how can we get more translation out there? Having an international perspective in a globalized and interdependent world and embracing difference is absolutely essential. And alongside that freedom of expression, and I'm sure you're all aware of what's happening in Turkey with writers and journalists being put into prison, in Russia, anyone who dares to speak the truth right now, how do we defend freedom of express expression? What is the role of us as cultural workers, as producers, artists, to give voice to, to, to open up those voices? International solidarity, it's essential. Um, but literature, 
writing stories. I don't know how many of you know the wonderful Nigerian writer, Chimananda Ngozi Adichie. She came to the free word earlier this year and she talked about the role of literature. And she said, to read or write, to, to read or write literature is to search for humanity. Literature reveals truths. We live in a world of fact and figures. Facts are important, but they must coexist with human stories. I ask my characters, what do they dream about? How do they fall in love? How do they resolve family quarrels? Literature is a leap of the imagination. It's about how we are different, yet all share the quest for value. And within London, which is one of the most diverse multicultural cities in the world, 360 languages are spoken. And English is the second language in half of our schools in London. Imagine that. And yet this is a country that's cutting itself off from Europe and the world. But actually, how do we make, celebrate this as an asset? At Free Word, we worked in schools, developing writing skills. We worked in libraries, promoting world literature, led workshops in prisons. Something like 50% of prisoners are illiterate. How do we develop those skills so they can have a voice? We worked in refugee centers. We campaigned for censored and imprisoned writers internationally. We put on evenings with migrant writers from Poland, Bulgaria, Nigeria, Syria, and many other places, celebrating their stories. In short, what we were trying to do was to change the narrative of fear, of nationalism, insularity, and prejudice that was fast gaining momentum in the Brexit campaign, and actually is across Europe. Last month, a collection of essays came out in a book called The Good Immigrant, because we know how migrants, refugees, are constantly being demonized. And in its, its editor, Nikesh Shukla, said its ambition is to hold up a small yet significant mirror to those people who often feel unrepresented and marginalized. Because this is our country too, and because we all know and believe that books can change lives, celebrate lives and give them significance. So I guess the question I'm asking us all today, this evening, is how can we harness these approaches to designing a narrative for Europe through literature and storytelling. Another British author, Philip Pullman, believes that after nourishment, shelter and companionships, stories are the things that we need most in the world. Stories about our continent are so needed at this dangerous moment in our history. They carry our memories, they reflect our present in all its complexity, and they also forge our futures. Those stories, of course, are told through all art forms. The role of the artist, whether they be a theatre maker, musician, writer, is to be the witness to the history of our time. And of course, many other things to be witness to at the moment, urgent issues, migration, but also, you mentioned this earlier, climate change, the environment, and, and I would very much like to speak about this at another time if we have a moment afterwards. But really the need is, who are we listening to? We need to bring in a diversity of voices from across our societies, share the stories across society, in community spaces, in schools, not just in established cultural institutions, and don't ignore, but involve, above all, today's youth who feels so disenfranchised. 64% of 18 to 24 year olds voted in the Brexit, sorry, in the referendum, which resulted in Brexit, the largest turnout of young people in any election ever in Britain. 75% voted to remain. How much time do I have? Do we have to? In that case, we could, there is a film, but I won't show it to you, but you will see that there is a movement now with young people it's called Undivided Voices in a Divided Nation. And they have put a message across loud and clear to the politicians who are now busily negotiating Brexit. Don't let us leave Europe. We are Europeans. 
And it's not that we don't have ideas, it's just that we don't have a place to share them. Culture, creativity is the place they want to share them. Um, and they want to create a future we see. Um, I'm going to end with another wonderful author, Zadie Smith, who was speaking in Berlin last month, accepting the 2016 Welt Literature Prize. She was reflecting rather wryly on the absurdity of, accept, of accepting a literary prize during, and I quote her, the darkest political times I have ever known. As President Trump rises in the West, a united Europe drops below the horizon. But, she reminded her audience, progress is never permanent, will always be threatened, must be redoubled restated and reimagined to survive. Human societies, she said, are like complex musical scores from which melodies and harmonies can be teased out and others ignored or suppressed, depending at least in part on who is doing the conducting. And whilst at the moment, all over the world, the conductors standing in front of this human orchestra have only the meanest and the most banal melodies in mind. Those of us who remember a finer music must try now to play it and encourage others, if we can, to sing along. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rose. It seems to be somehow a connection already between Richard and Rose, because Richard, remember that the Edinburgh Festival was created right after a war, so it seems that it's like a reaction, and I think that your whole speech was really reactive and talking about what can we do to change things and what's the uh, role of cultural artists and operators. Now it's time for, for policy makers, the third voice somehow, that could be heard this evening. For that, it's a great honor and pleasure to introduce to you Jens Niemann Christensen. He's a Deputy Director General of Ed for Education and Culture. And so he's Danish, and in that sense, I would like to remember that tomorrow we will be, have here the uh, main responsibles for the uh, Aarhus 2017 European Capital of Culture in Denmark. And so he's Danish and holds a master's degree in business economics and international economics. He's been employed for the, in the European institution since 1979, so he knows very well about European institutions and has, among other things, been a member of the cabinet of Vice President Henning Christofferson and uh, advisor at the Danish per permanent EU representation dealing with the convention and the preparations of the intergovernmental conference drafting a constitutional treaty for the European Union. Since 2003 to 2014, Jeans uh, worked as a director in the Secretariat General for many different issues such as civil society, directorate EBET, regulations, institutional issues, relations with the European Parliament, or policy coordination. From 16 September 2014, he was appointed Deputy Director General in the Directorate General for Education and Culture. It's a long, long title. The floor is yours, Jens. Thank you very much for being here. Well, thank you for inviting me to come here and speak to you briefly. Um, when I listen to all that, you feel incredibly old. Um, and Richard, I want to say it's a pleasure to meet you here tonight because um, you as a young man, and we'll know that I met a few months ago with Boris Paher, who is, some of you may not have heard of him, so let me share with you. He is uh, a writer. He is 103 years old. He also went to a concentration camp, just as the lady we talked about before, Mrs. Weil. And he travels around, speaks about culture and what his life has taught him. And he says exactly that, um, the Nazis were first and foremost afraid about the cultural freedoms in so many ways. He was born in the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, uh, and uh, he is still an amazing driving force for believing in the good of Europe. And it's amazing to meet such a man, and therefore it's nice to meet a young man like you, who will still be traveling for many years to come to do this. 
I wanted to start with this because, of course, I could have started with um, my rather famed compatriot who wandered on the ramparts of the Kronborg Castle wondering what, what he should be or not to be. And what Europe is to be or not to be is, of course, quite existential and essential also today, perhaps even more than ever. Um, and yet, while I will, in my words here today, perhaps we could be slightly gloomy, it's not meant in the sense that I am, you will not be surprised, a strong believer in Europe. I believe uh, Europe today, and I can almost start with my conclusion, uh, in whatever sense, Europe is today more needed than ever. The issues that are confronting us as citizens in our daily lives, that are confronting our countries, our communities, San Sebastian, the Basque Country, these issues are of a nature that will not seriously find their solutions in isolation by looking inwards and being afraid of what happens around us. And I'm really afraid today, and I was there I switch into a more, well, more, more doomy picture, because confronted with these issues, and I will mention them in a minute, some of them, there are voices of simplistic ways forward, voices of rejection, voices of division, voices of looking down at other people, other cultures, even neighbors. And let's never forget that that was the poison that ruined the 20th century for Europe in two world wars. Uh, we, we need to realize that either we understand much more about each other through culture, through education, or you can very easily run away with very populist, dangerous voices that we hear from certain media and from certain people who speak publicly in our countries. And I'm afraid of that because this is something that is relatively new to the last few years. And let me just say what are the issues that I think where it's so evident. You live here in the Basque country, in Spain, which has been more hit than most European countries by the economic crisis. You have suffered youth unemployment beyond imagination. Young people have been out of job for years, and we all know today that even the prospects of them still finding a job is still a struggle, an uphill struggle. And one of the things about Europe is that Europe has identified instruments and help ways to fight youth unemployment. And it is falling. I, mean, I don't have to tell you, I'm sure. But we are still far from home. In the European Union today, we count four and a quarter million young unemployed. And my commission president said when he took office, I want my commission, and therefore me as an official, to be the commission for the young, and particularly for the young unemployed. They are the ones who haven't, don't have a microphone and are not at the table of the meetings where member states or parliamentarians meet to discuss about Europe. So I want my commission to be their voice every day, every day and on all the files. And I think this is still an amazing challenge and we should never forget it because the fear is that unless we work together to generate growth and generate more jobs and create the training that means that young people get the skills to find jobs, unless we do this, we risk losing a generation of young people because in a few years, new young people will come up with new educational backgrounds and will match better the labor market. So youth unemployment is at the heart of it, and I would like to mention that first. Then, of course, we have had, you heard it also referred to before, the refugee crisis. And it has been a challenge. No, I mean, you can say somebody saw it coming, but nobody really saw it coming with such a speed. Suddenly, we were confronted with between one and one and a half million people coming to our shores and moving, walking through Europe. I mean, this is the kind of pictures that you would have thought was 1945 after the armistice where people started walking back to where they came from or where they were moved because of the borders were changed. Here we saw people walking from Raqqa or from Syria or from Iraq and they walked to Europe or they sailed some of the parts and tried to survive that part of the journey as well and then they walked through Europe. I mean, I, imagine a long I mean, I've never seen that in my country. In Denmark, little Denmark, people were blocking the motorways, walking in the thousands north. And I think I'm mentioning this because not only because it's a huge challenge, 
both in every sense of the word, because these are, sometimes I mention the numbers like I do now, and we tend to forget that each one is an individual human being. And my responsibility as is also as Deputy Director General for Education is that there are hundreds of thousands of young kids, unaccompanied children, who come here and who need individually to be brought into an educational pathway to take them forward and try to get them in a better life. And the task is incredibly big. And we should recognize the efforts done in so many member states to meet that challenge. When I mention it here today, it's also because it brings out some of the monsters in some of the member states. Why? Because, what, 95% of them are Muslims. And you hear about ideas such as we cannot build mosques in our cities. It doesn't fit the architecture or uh, they don't fit in. And this is again the populist dangerous voices that we have. The reason why I'm mentioning it is that that is built on ignorance. I don't know about you guys and girls in this room, but I know today incredibly little about Islam. And I'm ashamed to say it. It is one of the world's biggest religions. It is a universe of culture. When we, in my, I, I was brought up to speak about the Dark Ages, you know, 8th, 9th, 10th century. North Africa was a universe of enlightenment of Islamic scientists, astronomers, and writers. We just, in our own self-obsessed, centralized world, thought that since it was, it was Dark Ages for everybody because it was Dark Ages with us. We don't know a lot about Islam. We don't know a lot about the different strands of Islam. We don't know what it is. And therefore, it's very easy to play on people's prejudices and ignorance. Again, that feeds into the populist message I wanted to say. And that links on to a third challenge, which is, of course, very much present, and I live in Brussels, the recent terrorist attacks, the lack of security in the streets. And I'm mentioning this because in Brussels, I live two or three kilometers from the famed commune of Molenbeek, uh, which was the center, epicenter of some, many of the terrorists who went to Paris or attacked in Brussels in the metro system or in the airport. What I take away from that, I wanted to pass to you as a message tonight, is that these were all young men. They were almost all born in Belgium. They had their families there. They had their brothers and sisters there. They went to school there. They were not necessarily unemployed, derelict people. They were there with everything you would expect to be a normal functioning young first, second, or third generation immigrant. And still some of them feel so rootless that they can't identify in any way whatsoever with the country they live in. And this is one of the things that comes back to culture in a different sense. Because I preach, and I go to many, many school meetings and things like that, that we need to, of course, help these young to understand better the values, what Europe is about. Europe is not a union of agricultural policy. It's not even a union of cultural capitals. It is first and foremost a union of values between people who want to share a destiny together. And for that, we have a number of policies. But one of the things is that you can't just go out and preach that in Molenbeek. There is also a journey for the rest of us to engage in, to understand and respect others. Many, many European countries are in that journey now. Many countries were monolithic in the sense of being virtually one country, one language, one religion. You go into classrooms in many, many European member states, and they are multicultural and multireligious. And the teachers are struggling to explain and understand what it means for them, how to react to things being said. And therefore, uh, I'm just saying, the terrorism and these ruthless young people raises questions for us. But it's not only a question of how we can also reach them and convince them to accept the values and what European democracy, freedom, respect, equality between men and women, and all these fundamentals of what we are about in Europe, but it is also an issue for us of being willing to reach out and understand that they are going to be with us forever. It's not, don't expect them to go on a train back to these countries, 
Many of them have been here for generations now, one or two generations at least. So let's be honest about it. It's also a challenge to us to be able to understand these people who are with us and have a much greater mutual respect, have inclusive societies built on the diversity and the richness of Europe. We've had it before. I mean, before it was nations fighting each other in a dangerous war of superiority and grandness. These days, the conflicts are within the communities, and we need to be able to confront that. And then, of course, I could have talked about climate change, but I mean, we already covered it a bit. I will just say a few words about another issue, which is also cultural, but from a different perspective, globalization. Now, um, you all know the map of the world. I'm sure you grew up in a classroom where you have North and South America, and you have Europe and Africa in the middle, and Asia over there, and Australia. This is a dilution of madness. Anybody who knows the globe is this is not how the world is. Europe is actually, if you print it by making a timeline down the Pacific, a little lump somewhere over to the left. And I'm mentioning this because the picture is there. Globalization is here and will change the universe as we have known it. And we need to work with other cultures, not only China and Japan, but Africa, and, and understand also the differences we have. We can't just can't expect that these countries and these, with sometimes thousands of years of culture, just take over European values and democracy models and start functioning like they could just copy and paste our constitutions. We need to understand the diversity and the background they come from. And therefore, I just wanted to say that map illustrates some of the madness in Europe that we think we are so incredibly big, whereas in a few years' time, we will make up less than 5% of the population on this earth. And as a friend of mine said once, a Chinese joke, and I hope there are no Chinese in the room because it can be misunderstood, but it was a joke. I'm saying it's a joke, so no, uh, that the Chinese say themselves and with reason, and I'm an economist, that for the last 2,200 years, the Chinese economy was by far the biggest in the world, except for the last 200 years. And for China, that is a bracket they're about to close. Uh, I'm just saying, so we have to accept that it offers immense opportunities, globalization, if we are able to work with other cultures and be open and respectful but as we come and say, well, here we are, superior, take our model, our values and our models are better, and try to tell them how to live their lives, I'm afraid we are in for a rough ride. It doesn't mean that we should not stand for these values and our lifestyles here. But I do believe we must accept that some others have done other journeys in their history of developing cultural patterns, and that that must also be seen as for them to decide uh, in freedom and in, democr in democratic ways forward. Now, as I said before, uh, for us, of course, and I go back to that, education is also at the heart of this. And the ministers of education has actually signed up to it after the Paris attacks. But they want to focus on the classroom to generate a much greater understanding of the cultural diversity, to generate young people in our societies which acquire uh, social, civic, and intercultural competences that we didn't get when I went to school, to be honest. I mean, we spent ages learning about how great Denmark was and how we ruled half of the world. I mean, apart from uh, Rose's world where I had a king, uh, Canute the Great, sitting over there for some time ago, but it was a thousand years ago. Huh? We were convinced that the Vikings brought cultural civilization to everybody. There is this madness of twisting these things, and I would like to see that the, the classroom opens up and accepts a far, far more open debate about social, civic, and intercultural competences among young people, which I think will be a precondition for our young to function in the future in Europe. Now, uh, this, and I, I'm optimistic. I will end with that. I will opt I'm optimistic about it in that sense that after the horrendous terrorist attacks in Paris under Charlie Hebdo and uh, afterwards other terrorist attacks, I saw a program, a film, uh, because I was in Paris and I also bought the Charlie Hebdo 
everybody did, so to speak, wanted to stand up for freedom of speech. This is part of what Europe is about. You can insult me uh, if you want to, because this is, you can't have these restrictions in it. That said, of course, everybody was furious and angry about what, what, uh, was, what had happened, and legitimately so. They filmed a classroom of young uh, kids, in 15, 16 year olds, in a classroom discussing uh, what had happened in France. And it was incredibly pleasant to listen to the discussion because it was kind of a sophisticated discussion where some of the pupils were saying, yes, of course, I'm going to stand up for the right to say what, what I believe in and what I think, but do I have to say it if I know it hurts? Yeah. I mean, we know everybody, anybody in this room who has seen Charlie Hebdo knows that it's a sense of humor which drives to the heart of being hurtful if you are sensitive to some of the issues covered. Uh, it can be fun. Some, there are limits to what is fun in different people's minds. But I just wanted to say that was amazingly to see young people simply discuss that between them, uh, these values. So let me end by just saying youth is at the heart of our agenda. Uh, only last week we adopted a huge youth program. And it includes something which I would say also is important for you, which is called the European Youth, uh, European um, uh, Solidarity Call, which is a call where young people can sign up between 18 and 30 and uh, go and help on the ground, whether it is in Lesbos, in the, when the dingies arrive, rubber boats arrive with refugees, whether it is uh, in earthquake zones in Italy, and we will be funding that uh, movement of young people for between two and 12 months in the future from sometime next summer. But you can already sign up as interested in being part of such a European Solidarity Corps. Because one thing I do believe today is that what we are missing is not the solidarity between people. I feel it everywhere I go. Young people, but people in general feel they want to help and reach out but I feel a strong need to strengthen the solidarity between the nations of Europe, where there's we've seen a tendency in the last few years to be far more my, my, I'm myself enough. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today, and I would be happy to answer questions if there are any. Thank you very much to the three of you. Actually, I think that it was uh, really inspiring and uh, I already see some people that will want to ask questions. I know that you're not raising your hands, don't panic. But I'm going to ask the first question and I'm sure that some others will come in the meantime. And I will start with an easy question. I will try to find similarities between the, 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 your speeches. And I think that briefly, um, when, for instance, Richard mentioned that the Edinburgh Festival was created in 1947, right after the Second World War, I, I connected to this city that you were mentioning to, and in 1939, San Sebastian created its first Quincena Musical, is the classic music festival, just after the Civil War in Spain. So, th this way I connect to the word of reaction. It seems that culture and art can be as the antidote, like the cure, like the vaccine against these difficult situations, these wars, these conflicts. And, and you were also, Rose, giving many examples or, and, and saying how uh, cultural artists and, and operators were pushing for the remain in the case of Brexit, as, again, as a symptom of how artistic movement can be more sensitive sensitive or empathetic to, uh, to cohesion, to, to the union. And I think that um, uh, Jens did a wonderful, world, uh, wonderful work summarizing, unfortunately, all the challenges that we have with terrorism, <laughs> with environment, and all those issues that are somehow um, attacking a European Union. I will ask you some help, and this is the question. It's wonderful and kind of easy, if I can say, to talk about European narrative in a very abstract and wide level. But here we are in San Sebastian, and this city is this year European capital of culture. I see here some responsibles for culture in this city, in the policy making of this city and the programming of this city. So, 
Can you give us examples or ways to apply a new European narrative perspective through creativity for the program of this city or the artists? I mean, it's wonderful to say that we're in favor of education and uh, very empathetic and uh, youth are, no, no. I know that the question is easy. Answer is a difficult one, I know. But what can we do here in San Sebastian to push a new narrative for Europe, cohesion and union by means of creativity, arts and culture? Whoever wants to start. Well, you have a certain disadvantage. Because the lingua franca of our world now controlled by the computer <laughs> is really the language that the world uses to communicate ideas. And it is sadly the lingua franca of our time, no longer French, but English. It's a ridiculous situation that the language used in the European Parliament, the most effective language, is English. And the stupid and pathetic, ill-educated politicians never mentioned that. They never mentioned that the European Union needs this language which is a combination of every language in Europe. Do you realize that? Practically every word comes from the Viking world, the German world, the Dutch world, the Spanish world, the Italian world, the Latin world. And this is the language which the, the founder of the Emden Festival depended upon. He said, no longer can we have a future for Europe using the German language or the French language. It has to be the language that the world uses, English. This is a great advantage, but it's also a disadvantage because practically everything, if you're not careful, planned for the Edinburgh Festival is expressed in the English language. And it's been my job to say, I don't want to know about the reality of Shakespeare, who used this English language in a superb way. I don't want it again in English. I want, for example, the National Theatre of, um, which country? Cryova. Estonia. 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 And the Youth Theatre, National Youth Theatre, spoke Ro Romeo and Juliet in the most superb mm -hmm. language, changing my idea of that masterpiece forever. And of course, I also asked not the Russian language version, but the Belarusian language version. We mustn't forget another language which is not Russian, which is Belarusian. And I also presented a Midsummer Night's Dream in German from Munich. It's been my task to do this. Of course, it, it doesn't work economically because you reduce your audience. The audience is predominantly English speaking. And I'm not talking about an audience which is English speaking uh, in terms of um, how we converse amongst ourselves, but I'm talking about the media in general, television. I, I think that in, in that case, Rose, maybe you can give us some some lights because I, I, since you were saying and and I agree with that, verbal arts are more difficult 
to be traveling, to be jumping over boundaries, but you have been working in literature and in a, in a festival for that for many, many years. Uh, how can we deal with that? And at the same time, while you were talking, you were saying that we shouldn't, I really liked the idea of how could we, uh, how we could avoid to be betrayed by the event culture. I think you said exactly mm -hmm. uh, that. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're in a, and, and we're all the time talking about festivals mm -hmm. and event is the word that <laughs> people overall understand when we refer to culture. So I will go with those two, mm. two, two questions. How not to be betrayed? I mean, because you asked the question and I really wanted the answer in your case. And the second one, just connecting to Richard's mention about verbal arts. How can we have Midsummer Night's Dream? By the way, we presented the premiere in this year, in the 21st of June, in Basque, oh. in the park of the city, and it was a total sold out for the first time. But just how could these be part of a European narrative? How can we work with verbal arts or literature? Okay, I'll answer that question first because this is something that everybody used to ask us when we presented Shakespeare or a contemporary play in Russian or whatever. For a start, the, the act of theatre is not just verbal. In many countries, you have spectators watching what is happening. What, what is happening on stage conveys meaning as much as what is said. And the theatre brings in music as well. So it's a combination of communication, and we insisted on this. And also, it's very important to listen to other languages. Of course, not to be left completely without a sense of what is the story, but you must remember to watch. And how other people express themselves from other cultures is a key to understanding them as nations and bring it coming closer. In literature, it's very simple, really. I mean, we should be learning more languages, I think, because by learning more languages, you understand the power of language. How language is so often used to control, uh, to stop people thinking, whereas actually, if you have two or three languages, you realize that you, you can actually create worlds through languages and not be controlled by language. Um, but of course, translation is, is vital. And, and there's a wonderful um, writer called Ungugi Watianga from, from Kenya, who is beginning to write in his own Kikuyu language, reclaiming it from uh, imperialistic Britain, because <coughs> a lot of literature in, in India and Africa is written in English. OK, it's, it's fine. That's a unifying language. But also, you then miss out on the diversity of, of, of the smaller and the important languages. And he said, I'm now writing in Kikuyu, but it's going to be translated. And he said, translation is the languages of all language. <laughs> it's the language of all languages. So um, that's something on the translation and, and, and uh, language question. On the event culture, festivals, I think, they, they have to find a way to be as much about the process as the product. So you have the festival is the tip of the iceberg of, of, of many things happening underneath. Participation by the city who is holding the festival. Um, opening up exchanges throughout the year as you prepare for the festival. I'm sure you had a lot of this going on when you were planning for the ca capital of culture. Yeah. And actually, also, rather than, than imposing, going out with your shopping bag <laughs> and saying, I'll have this and that, you actually you have a bit of that because you see the most wonderful opera or exhibition, you want to bring it and share it with your fellow citizens. But also let those fellow citizens have the opportunity to create and bring their voices in and ensure, I don't know what has happened, I want to know more about what's happening here, whose voices are heard in the exhibitions, in the plays, in the writing. Are schools involved? I'm sure they are. Celebrating the city and its connections with the world. It's about coming back to what somebody said earlier. I mean, it might have been you, Katharina. The connect and, and, and Richard, only connect. only connect. Only connect. How festivals can connect. Yeah, that's, that's totally true. And then we will come back to that question uh, when we were, we were saying, how do we listen 
whose voices should be heard because th that deals with communication and I think that it's an, an, a vital part in that case. But just, uh, Jens, in, in this case, you were talking about Charlie Hebdo and, and Paris and uh, you, uh, I, I remembered uh, that on Monday we had here French writer Marie Dariussec she lives in Paris, but was born in Bayonne, and she was saying that some years ago, when she came to the Basque country, here she could feel afraid, and in Paris she could feel at home, and now she feels exactly the opposite. So, but not just, I remember this because she said that when Charlie Hebdo happened, for the first time she decided to write in English. She has been writing in French for all her life, but she thought that people internationally should know about what was going on. What was the reaction that Charlie Hebdo was not making laugh of religion. That was a, a proper uh, journal in that case, all the work that they have been doing. And the question for you in that case could be just coming back to, to my first question is like, uh, according to all the issues and challenges that you have mentioned, a city like San Sebastian, or cultural operators, artists, human beings, individuals that are sitting there or are watching us by uh, streaming, what can they do? Well, I, I hope, and I will say that more in an abstract, that um, when uh, San Sebastian was chosen, at least that is what is the case now, we look for um, elements of continuity beyond the year, to be honest. Uh, because, I mean, uh, Seth, I mean, I haven't had the opportunity really to visit your cultural capital. I've been around to bits and pieces in different capitals. And this is not about a Shakespeare uh, Midsummer Night's Dream or a, a, a dance festival. There was a major Japanese element in, in Filson and things like that. All that is great. And I, I really think you should not underestimate it. But what is important is what, what happens after the year. Has anything changed? Have we learned, as you say, networking uh, between cultural actors, between the political and administrative and the educational systems to uh, have a vibrant cultural life beyond and be willing to take in and be far more open because some, one of the things that really comes out of the cultural capitals is this openness, as I spoke about. And therefore, it should, these windows and doors should stay open and you should actively pursue those dialogues, those contacts with actors wherever they are in Europe, whether they come from Edinburgh or whether they come from London or whether they come from Brussels. And I meet lots and lots of cultural actors who are looking for partners and are looking for these kind of things. And let me therefore end by simply saying this is of course why we have a program that can fund this kind of stuff. You, got, you get very little money for a cultural capital and we get a lot of bang for the money. Uh, because it's really, for those who don't know, we are talking about peanuts in terms of EU contribution to having it. It is the honor of getting it. That, yep. that is, so it's one of the most budgetary successful event, things we have in EU finances because, uh, because it mobilizes funds far beyond. But that said, we have a program called Creative Europe. And Creative Europe funds activities which can take place here in San Sebastian, but must take place elsewhere as well. We can't just go and fund a local activity in San Sebastian because we, can't, we wouldn't be able to explain to the taxpayers in Greece or in Portugal why we would fund something which is narrowly a national activity, even if it is Shakespeare again. So what we demand and is what we have agreed is we need some criteria for choosing what we can fund. And in many of these projects that we support, it can be music, it can be lit literature or whatever. We need at least five partners from five different member states. And then let me end by just re to, to Rose's point saying we also in that Creative Europe program fund translations. It's one of the mainstreams and it mainly is, sorry to say to you guys, translation into lesser used languages. We don't need public funding to translate from French to English or to German. And you, so what we can see is that the Romanians are incredibly active in using this, both to have things translated into Romanian and out of Romanian into other languages. And we have had authors who have suddenly seen a spread of their works over Europe, or all over Europe because of the translations we have paid for. So we have different instruments that are varied down to the ground on earth, uh, on, the, on the ground, but you have to play the ball yourself. We're not gonna sit in my office 
and invent activities that could uh, help you develop these networks, but they are there. I'm sure you have already established lots of contacts now. Yeah, so far we um, created a project called Other Words that got the maximum amount of uh, funding from the Creative Europe. It's uh, um, led by the Donostia Cultura, which is the cultural department of the city, and it's to promote in literature new translations and uh, artistic residences for writers from Ireland, the Netherlands, Macedonia, Slovenia, and uh, this region. So, and it will continue until 2019. So in that case, it's true that I, I think that we need to be proactive, but it's, it's always good to, to ask you, and in this case, to ask you as well. I, uh, I told that maybe somebody could like to ask any questions. If somebody has any questions, any comments to ask, this could be the perfect moment. I must tell you that one of the best moments that I remember the, in these European dialogues was uh, when Durao Barroso came and there was an, an old lady, sorry for the, the age mentioned, that she raised her hand and said that she was completely against what he has said in a very good way. And this is the main aim and spirit of this project. So don't hesitate, please, if somebody has a question to ask. Otherwise, I have a full bunch of them <laughs> and it can be, uh, I can continue threatening you, but not for a long time anyway. Just, if there is any question, just raise your hands, okay? Okay. Yeah. yeah. My name's Giles Sutherland. I work for The Times. Um, thank you all so much for your very interesting contribution. Um, as a Scot, um, I've been very interested in learning a little bit about your culture here. And uh, I've managed to learn a few words, but not very successfully. Um, I hope I get the pronunciation right. Is uh, Asko? Tell me if it's right. But as a as a small country on the edge of Europe, um, a bit like this region, uh, we voted in Scotland. This is a point of information: 62% to remain in the European Union. And that's something that your audience may not be aware of. And I would like um, your audience to note also that two years prior to the Brexit or the EU referendum, there was a referendum in Scotland about whether Scotland should remain part of the United Kingdom. And there was quite a narrow uh, majority voting to stay within the United Kingdom. But subsequent to the Brexit vote, quite a number of uh, voices have come forward and have been discussing, well, what would have happened if we had <coughs> voted to leave the United Kingdom? Uh, we w would we still be part of the European Union? And it's something that's, I think, a, it's a question and a point worth pondering. I just wanted to clarify that because it wasn't particularly clear from some of the points that were being made, okay? But, thank you. Okay. You clap, you, you agree with that, Richard? Well, I, I do agree with that, and most of what uh, Giles Sutherland has to say in the columns of the Times which of course is an example of an English-speaking national newspaper which is read all over the world. He is mainly concerned with, the, with that aspect of the, of, of the arts which doesn't need words, talking about the visual arts. <coughs> 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 Charles, <coughs> are you? <coughs> what is your? What have you learned from this gathering? Yeah, maybe. Do you want to ask answer the question? It will be better. Are you right? <coughs> okay. What Richard asked was. What have I learned? Um, I 
think I've learned a great deal from the experience of being here over the past couple of days. Um, I've learned a great deal about a city and a region I, I'm ashamed to say I knew very little about. Um, I've been very impressed by what I've seen, um, by the devotion and dedication to cultural values, uh, which I find very impressive. And I think you, you take with you yourself, your culture, uh, but you also learn about yourself. And I think the questioning that goes on is, in, in my mind, is uh, certainly about identity, what, it, what it's meant to be a European. My part of my family are Danish. My partner is Polish. I spend a great deal of time traveling around Europe. Um, and the, uh, the idea of identities are very important. I've been engaged in a number of conversations recently um, <coughs> with people in Europe. I think I would say they would be moderately well-educated, reasonable people. And um, just in reference to what you were saying about the immigration crisis, I've, I've heard a great deal of this um, Islamophobic sentiment being expressed by people uh, from whom I would not normally have expected such sentiment. And that, that I think we live in very dangerous times. And I think that uh, this kind of ignorance and prejudice, and it can come from reasonable people. They're not right wing bigots, um, they, may, they may not be well informed but I think it has to be challenged and tackled at every turn. And I think we have a, a civic responsibility um, amongst many other responsibilities to, to tackle such things. I could talk at great length about many other things, but I've learned some of these things here. Thank you. Thank you very much, then. If uh, there isn't any other questions, oh, would you like to ask? Yeah. We have a, a question there, please. No, I was very happy to hear that youth is at the center of the, of the agenda, at least for, for your DG. And I was just wondering what message any of the speakers have tonight to European youth who, unlike many of us who have maybe lived through certain generations and seen that we can bounce back, some have a very critical and cynical view. Also, in light of the, the statistics that Rose mentioned, um, feeling very abandoned and very cynical about the future. So what message of hope would any of you have uh, from more years of experience, per se, to those coming up now, entering the job force for the first time? What message do you have for them? Yeah, what message of hope have yeah, we that's it. She was saying that the European youth, since it's at the centre, so it was really happy to hear that. Yeah. And what type of message, okay. what is the main idea that we could pass, uh, underlining hope and good, positive ideas for youth somehow? What is the message that we should spread? I mean, I, I think the first thing to say is that young people have become more engaged in politics. <laughs> In, in Britain and I think possibly across Europe. I think people hadn't realized in Britain what they were going to lose. And they woke up and the more they understood, the more they were angry and dismayed. And so it really has lit a fire. And, and we could show this one minute because what it's a very short um, video, but you see young people from every faith, from every background coming from north, middle, and south of England, from cities. And they're actually saying, we want a voice. So I think, A, it's made young people more engaged, and they think they can, we have ideas, but we want a platform. And hopefully, it has told our politicians that they have to make space. They have to develop ways in which they can listen. Um, so I think, that's important. Um, in terms of creative creativity, we will continue the cultural community to 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 give to try and give more space to more diverse voices. And in Britain, it's always been this problem, even with the so-called enlightened thinkers, uh -huh. that they their knee-jerk reaction is is not to think beyond Britain. 
they, they do not think in an international way. And, and it's, I, they may leap over Europe, they may work with India, or they may work with China even, because it's the economic imperative. But actually, what is the urgency is to work in a cultural way, to exchange ideas, to create a solidarity within, acro across Europe. So this is, this is the problem with Britain. We jump over Europe. We are part of Europe, but we go to the rest of the world. How do we just say, hold on, just cross the channel and engage? Great. Any messages for youth? Yeah, well, I, mean, I, I wanted to say that in a way, um, um, I think youth has an incredible opportunity to shape the future of the continent in a way that was not there before. Uh, uh, I think today young people do not join political parties. I know there may be some here, but I mean, basically, I, don't, I know very few young people who go through the classic political environment. And still I meet lots of young people who have opinions about the society they live in, and they want to shape it. And I think that is amazing, and this is what this new narrative is all about. Uh, when uh, President Barroso, as you mentioned, launched this, he basically wanted to say uh, to uh, young people, I mean, the future is yours. You're going to live there. <laughs> some of us will not be there uh, in, in some decades' time. So shape it in your image and what you want to make of it. it don't, don't start moaning about it or saying this is not working. You have an opportunity. And forget about the institutions. Forget about the politicians. Forget about all these mental constraints that we have on the debate. Discuss what Europe should be about. And the good message is that when we do that, and we've now done it for a few years, and we've had almost a dozen meetings of young people all over Europe, they start in the corner of speaking about what they want, what kind of issues needs to be dealt with, environment, security, jobs for them, and things like that. And once they come through that, they come to a point where they say, and for that, of course, you need a European Union of a kind. You can't just sit in each corner here in the Basque country or in, in Poland or whatever and think you can do that in an abstract. You need the framework to do these things. So I have the positive message is the microphone is yours and, and you, you don't have to change Europe in the sense of, of uh, joining parties and things like that because I think actually there is a huge receptive uh, willingness also from the cultural community to, to reach out to young people and say join in and be part of uh, a, a creating a different Europe than the one uh, that we have lived in the last years. Uh, Rita, are you feeling well just to ask you the last reflections for youth people? Well, I, I must say, I think there's a great truth in the idea that the worst of times often turns out to be the best of times, when the human race is up against an impossible situation, like the First or Second World War, or for example, the Cold War, or for example, this obscenity of, of Brexit. That's exactly when the creative voice can be heard loud and clear. I think in a strange kind of way, we need an impossible challenge. And we've really got it now. But I don't want the answer to be in the language simply of the politician. I don't want the answer to be in terms of the euro. I don't want the answer to be really to do with rational thought. It's got to come from somewhere that's latent in all of us, which is about the poetic dimension. And I think we are bound to see solutions expressed through all the arts from the most surprising places. I found this all my life. I mean, what do I do with the fact 
that if I've experienced 70 Edinburgh festivals, each one or three weeks, that means for at least nearly three years of my life, I've been blessed with a, the highest expression of the greatest art of the world, and it's been dominated by European art. I'm sorry to say this is the case. It's an irony that Europe, in a state of, how can I say, self-destruction, in a, st a state where it hasn't quite recovered from the wounds of conflict. All of us have suffered from these wounds. The young people haven't yet perhaps understood the full impact of suffering. But I think we have to rely on them. And I have never for one second thought that culture on its own is the answer. If you have a coin, and it's very important to you because it represents your values, on one side will be the symbol of culture, but on the other side will be the symbol of education. So we've got a job to do, and maybe the European Union can help, where we rethink the nature of education so that we don't end up with generations to come misusing or, for that matter, ignoring the importance of the language, which is the very opposite of the language used by Donald Trump. This is the dangerous language, the language of lies, deception, and the malformation of truth. It is the function and purpose of art to tell the truth. And there is a great quotation by a marvelous, wonderful genius, a great poet called Keats, John Keats. He said, all you need to know in life is that truth is beauty, and beauty is truth. That's the message which is in the very embedded in every artistic expression. So how can we get that across? That if, if, if any human being wants to express the whole concept of truth and beauty, they are bound to use the language of art. And I think that every human being is an artist. I think that that's a perfect ending. Every human being is an artist for that. Uh, we were asking for a message for young people because we would like to finish not asking what to say to them, but letting them the floors and, and asking them what they had to do. So I'm going to invite two young ladies to come to the, to the floor. But before that, since it will be the end of the session and right after, we will have a short toast. And Rose was asking me if we could see the video she was mentioning. We will try to show it later, okay, as soon as everything is finished. But yeah, I wanted just to finish saying thank you very much to all of you for being here. Thank you to Globernance, to Caterina Yanivas, Juanjo Álvarez, Daniel Inenariti, and all your team, because I think that these years have been absolutely amazing, covering with wonderful topics and having wonderful guests and those that we had today. Thank you to Maria Luisa Valenciaga and all the team from the San Telmo Museum, because this was a wonderful place to, to be inspired by art and seduced by thoughts. Thank you to Sior Basaguren and all the team in San Sebastian 2016 that has been helping and, and promoting this project and to Laboral Cucha, of course. A sponsorship is crucial nowadays for culture. And so thank you very much to Laboral Cucha then. 
uh, that's everything that I had to say. Now, let me invite, please, uh, Marta Santano and Raquel Arias. They are both European law students and members of the European Law Students Association from the University of Deuso. They've been really pushing through all these years in the project in, in, from different sides to, to contribute in these sessions of European Dialogues. And I would like to invite them, the both the students, please stand up and join us here. <laughs> you, have, you have heard what they have to say to young people, now it's time to you. They are both students from the University of Deusto, double degree in law and business and law in co and communication at the third year. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, hello. First, we want to say that we are very pleased to have been invited here tonight uh, to the last European Dialogue of 2016. And we want to thank uh, Katerina for inviting us to, to give the, well, to, uh, for giving us the opportunity to talk to you tonight and to tell the opinion uh, in the name of the young people. Uh, well, uh, as members of, of the young community, even though it seems we, we live outside the, the real world, or even though, it, and even though at least for the moment, uh, we see that well, young people see that the European Union uh, is not something very far or very close to them. Uh, we, we see or we feel that it has been created a, a new culture in which, well, which wants to change things above essential uh, values such as equality, tolerance and integration. So there's no gap for division, fear, or terrorism. In addition, uh, we are us, young people, the ones who, who are making more opposition to radicalism, and that's a clear indication of the knowledge of our generation, which is prepared for improving the previous one, and that it's also prepared for building a better world in which everyone is proud of living. Despite the economic crisis and, and social unhappiness we live nowadays, which must be the main focus to, to resolve, the youth's driving force will make the European Union stronger, more consolidated and more persistent than ever. We will learn of past mistakes and wise decisions that have been taken before, because we don't want to, to make disappear this which has been so hard to create and which has offered so many advantages and opportunities to the whole European citizenship and especially to us young people. So to conclude or to sum up, I don't know, uh, the solution to the problems come by, by the hand of, of union, more Europe, not division, because common problems global problems need common solutions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marta and Raquel. I think it's a wonderful ending and I think we should toast uh, all together to find common solutions to common uh, problems and try to resolve them as soon as possible. Thank you very much to Rose, Richard and Jens. Thank you very much to everybody. Enjoy the evening and let's have a drink together and continue talking and trying to build up a better and uh, more uh, cohesive Europe. Thank you very much. <laughs>